thank you so much, Carolyn, uh, Tim, Barbara, uh, and everybody at the Center for Liturgy for this invitation. Um, as an alum of Notre Dame, it really is a joy and a privilege to be with you. I feel very honored at the invitation. I'm grateful to, uh, for the work that all of you do uh, throughout the country in our schools, in our diocese, in our parishes. Um, your background, many of your backgrounds are similar to mine. As Carolyn said, I used to teach middle school uh, language arts and social studies in a very small and very, very dear uh, Catholic school in Brownsville, Texas, right on the, the US-Mexico border. Uh, uh, place that we have heard much about in the news as of late. Um, I then moved to Boston, where I worked in parish ministry at a highly diverse parish. So I worked sort of in an intercultural capacity there as I was doing my graduate work in theology. The work I do now uh, concentrates on the convergence of liturgy and solidarity. Uh, in other words, I ask the question, how does liturgy enable us to become a community? So very relevant to the talks that we just heard, especially in cases uh, where we're confronted with the task of building community in the midst of profound difference, particularly cultural difference, racial difference, linguistic difference. What does it mean to call ourselves a Eucharistic community in the fullest and most integral sense of the word? In a way, right, it's responding to that eschatological nature of the Eucharist that Kimberly illuminated for us this morning, the idea that we both are and are ever on the way to becoming the body of Christ, uh, the body that we receive in the Mass. The Eucharist is, in a sense, both gift and task. Uh, what, in the most practical sense, then, does that call look like in this historical moment in our parishes and our schools? I'm going to suggest today uh, that nowhere are these questions more relevant uh, right now than in our parishes and in our schools. Uh, we're going to begin today by looking at the liturgical praxis of Pope Francis, uh, which, in a way that's particularly urgent in this historical moment, lovingly and persistently directs our attention to the borders. Uh, not only the geographical borders, right, but also the borders in our own midst, the borders of culture, of race, of language, etc., that increasingly characterize our parishes and schools. Francis calls us beyond ourselves in this way, not out of some desire to be politically correct or sort of some kind of benign desire to celebrate diversity in some superficial way, right? His call is much deeper than that. Francis's call uh, to become what in Hispanic ministry are called gente puente, uh, bridge builders, uh, is fundamentally a Eucharistic call, the call to become what we receive, to become the body of Christ in word and deed. From there, I'll invite us to consider two interrelated questions. Uh, first, how can we understand the imperative of building intercultural liturgical communities as a fundamentally Eucharistic task? And second, given the sweeping uh, demographic transformation underway in the church in the United States, which we'll talk much about, what are some of the key ways in which Latinos are evangelizing and catechizing the US church? Right? Sometimes we think of that uh, as going the other direction, but I'm gonna invite us to consider how we as the US church are actually being transformed, being catechized, being evangelized by the presence of Latino Catholics. Uh, then we'll conclude with your questions and hopefully um, even more than questions, your own reflections from your own contexts of work and ministry. So let's begin with, uh, with Pope Francis. Francis is a pastor of the borders. This is an image from February 17th, 2016, taken during the Pope's visit to Mexico. Just before celebrating mass in Juarez, Mexico, just across the border from El Paso, Texas, Pope Francis pauses for prayer at a memorial made for those who've died trying to reach the United States. The memorial, a towering iron cross emblazoned with an image of the Holy Family fleeing into Egypt, is surrounded by smaller, similar crosses. It's constructed on a platform overlooking the border between our two countries, uh, which is both visibly militarized and also very fluidly transnational. Uh, around 14,000 people a day actually cross uh, at uh, the, the most uh, heavily trafficked uh, point of the El Paso Juarez border um, legally for, for work, for school, for shopping, or to visit family. So um, it's a very transnational space. Uh, the beams of the cross evoke the iron beams that in many places along the border, including my former home of Brownsville, form the two-story high wall between our two countries. 
What Pope Francis offers the church, I want to suggest, is an embodied interpretation of the gospel in response to the global signs of the times. This image emblematizes in a particularly salient way the gravitational force that's at the heart of Francis's pontificate, which is this consistent pull towards the borders, the margins. His stance here is powerfully symbolic. This is a different angle of the same, the same thing. It's also quietly subversive, right? For three minutes, about three minutes, he dwelled here silently in this space charged with the memory of decades and centuries of human suffering and injustice occasioned by this unnatural division. In so doing, he invites the church, all of us, to dwell there too. Francis invites us, in other words, to make the peripheries the center of our liturgical imagination and pastoral attention, to make, we might say, a preferential option for the borderlands. Dwelling there, as Francis does, what we find is that it is the crucified and risen Christ whom we encounter. The palms that surround the cross, if you can see them, they're kind of at the bottom, uh, are also quietly evocative, right? Drawing our mind to Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, wherein practically in the same breath, Jesus was welcomed and condemned. <laughs> A sort of whiplash dynamic that's not unfamiliar to immigrants who are simultaneously welcomed for the economic labor they provide and rejected as humans equal in rights and dignity to us. Francis's prayer at the border was followed by the celebration of mass. The mass was simulcast across the border to the US where a massive crowd gathered in El Paso's Sun Bowl to participate in liturgical solidarity. Many more gathered along the border fence itself. The Eucharist was distributed simultaneously on both sides of the fence, dividing our two countries. That image summons to mind other images from the annual border masses concelebrated by border bishops in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Northern Mexico. The Eucharist there too is distributed to the faithful through the gaps in the border fence. Pause for a moment and consider this image. The act of sharing the Eucharist in this space of self-imposed division becomes a radical act of truth-telling. Right? It's a powerful witness to the self-giving love that's at the heart of the Eucharist and the heart of Jesus' own body, a love that overcomes efforts to contain it, right? a love that spills over walls and around fences, a love that unites what has been divided, a love that humanizes, that heals, that saves. The setting of Francis's liturgical and sacramental practice is not extrinsic to its meaning. In other words, Francis's celebration of the mass at the border isn't just about an outward demonstration of solidarity. The place itself is charged with sacramental grace. The border mass makes plain the primordial oneness of all baptized in Christ, the unity of Christ's body. At the same time, the perfect sacrifice of praise at the heart of the mass celebrated in this place reveals the idolatrous nature of the rituals of violence performed each day in these borderlands, distorted sacrifices to idols with names like security and nationalism, the rule of law. It's an anamnetic act, the ritual remembrance of Jesus' self-giving sacrifice itself grounded in the communal memory of the people of Israel to which the texts of the Old Testament hearken back again and again. Texts recited at the Passover meal to this day, texts which Jesus would have recited himself as he celebrated that Passover feast. Remember, O Israel, that you too were strangers in that land. You shall not oppress a stranger for you know the feelings of a stranger. Francis issues us the incarnational invitation to pitch our tents on the borders, the in-between spaces where nations, races, cultures, languages, classes, generations, and histories touch. For there he shows us, do we encounter Christ? In word and deed, Pope Francis invites us to view the borders as a locus ecclesiologicus, a Latin term that we could say means a, a place from which emerge renewed ways of conceiving and being church, propelled and guided by the Spirit of God. But living, as we do, in the midst of profound political and ideological polarization that we've heard so much about this week, advocating for what we might call a theological and pastoral option for the borderlands is not an easy argument to make. 
In our distorted national imagination, the specter of the border looms both as a dam holding back oncoming tides of the undesired other, and as a frontier to be conquered militarily, economically, and culturally. In our national imagination, borderlands are checkpoints, endpoints, spaces of danger and suspicion beyond which we dare venture only as tourists or service workers, right? Never as equals, <laughs> lest we too become undesirable. They are spaces uh, from which, like Nazareth, we who are formed to fear them come to believe that nothing good could ever come. In our national imagination, then, the architectural form proper to the borderland is not the bridge, but rather the iron fence or the concrete wall. Taught to fear our geographical borderlands, we imbibe, in turn, a fear of the borderlands that exist within our own near communities. The spaces in our churches, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, where races, cultures, and classes meet. This fear must be rejected as diametrically opposed to the freedom at the heart of the gospel. Re-envisioning borders not as the spaces where relationships and identities end, but rather where they begin. We are able to see them as spaces infused with the possibility of encounter, of communion, of salvation. This theological transvaluation of the border, to use the phrase of Cuban-American theologian Roberto Goizueta, is not merely the replacement of a false negative image of the border with an equally false romanticized one, right? The sort of rosy, idealized image of the joyful poor that we often come away from mission trips with. Rather, it's the replacement of a false image with a real one, an image of the border as it truly is, a space where the unifying spirit of God breathes new life into the church. Solidarity across borders becomes a real possibility when we approach this joining, not as an act of condescending service or a begrudging welcome, uh, but rather as a soteriological act, right? Born of a desire for true communion with our neighbors, a desire to be formed ever more perfectly into the body we receive in the Eucharist, a recognition that we are saved not as individuals or as like-minded homogenous enclaves, uh, but as a people, as one people. If this is the case, then the question Pope Francis implicitly poses to us then is the question that I also pose to us here this afternoon. Where are the borderlands to which we are called? Where are the borders in our midst? It's tempting to believe that the call of missionary discipleship, this outward centrifugal impulse toward loving encounter of which Francis so often speaks, compels us to journey somewhere else, right, far, far away. As Americans, our largely racially, cultural, and economically segregated existences encourages the misconception that in order to encounter difference in consequential and challenging ways, we need to go far, far away. The notion that the place for solidarity is somewhere else is a deceptive one because in some ways it exculpates us from our responsibility to scrutinize the contours of our own local realities. I want to suggest that one place we can all respond to the call to solidarity across borders is within our parishes and schools. The context with uh, most of you here, this, uh, within which most of you here this week uh, work and minister. During the remainder of our time together this afternoon, I will invite us to unpack what it might mean to view our parishes and schools as places where we might respond to Francis's invitation to Eucharistic solidarity. So we'll begin by getting a, a lay of the land, we might say. The Catholic Church in the US, as many of you are probably aware, is in the midst of a profound transformation, um, a transformation that's being played out most vividly at the level of the parish. Uh, today, more than one in three U.S. parishes serve multiple cultural, ethnic, and or linguistic communities. Um, I love this image of St. Clair in California. They have uh, English Mass, English Family Mass, Portuguese Mass, Spanish, Cantonese, Mandarin, Chinese Youth Mass, and then another English Mass just to bookend it. Um, this is a, a an extreme example of, of a dynamic that's that's happening in a lot of parishes, right? Uh, you know, we have the English community and the Spanish community is the most uh, typical arrangement of this, or the, the Venezuelan community, or the, you know, Vietnamese community, or the Korean community, etc. cetera. Uh, colloquially, we tend to refer to parishes like this as multicultural, multicultural parishes. Um, but in fact, in reality, calling such parishes multicultural is a bit of an overstatement. <laughs> um, is uh, uh, perhaps those of you who belong to such parishes or minister in such parishes can attest. Uh, typically, cultural and ethnic 
communities exist sort of in separate spheres, right? Separate silos, the English speaking community and the Spanish speaking community, for example, right? We attend different masses, we participate in different ministries and we generally kind of orbit around one another, intersecting maybe for brief moments in the parking lot or once or twice a year at a bilingual mass. So scholars and the US bishops uh, actually term such parishes shared parishes, um, because in most cases, that's exactly what they are, right? Two, three, sometimes sometimes like six <laughs> cultural sub-communities sharing a space, uh, but often little else. While Catholic parishes have long been sites of intense intercultural negotiation, really for as long as the Catholic Church has been in uh, what's now the United States, the present moment is unique in a few distinct ways. Um, and perhaps you'll see some of these trends reflected in your own parish context. First, uh, it's impossible to overstate the significance of the demographic transformation that's underway in the church in the US, particularly the extent to which Latinos are reshaping the church. Around 40% of US Catholics are Hispanic or Latino, and more than half of Catholic millennials, so like, you know, 35 and under, uh, teens and children are Latino. More than half, more than half of people my age or so and younger are Latino in the Catholic Church. 3% uh, of Catholics are African American, African or Afro Caribbean, another 5% are Asian. Overall, according to estimates by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, more than half of U.S. Catholics today are not of Euro-American descent. A quarter of Catholics in this country uh, today were born outside of the U.S. Uh, while the oft-repeated notion that the, uh, U.S. Catholicism is a, a church of immigrants is inadequate in a number of key ways, uh, primarily because it ignores the experiences of African American and Native American Catholics, it, in other ways it's very much the case, right? We are, in a sense, a church of immigrants. Um, we, are, we are an immigrant church on earth. <laughs> It's also worth noting uh, the geographical transformation underway in the church. While the former uh, Catholic urban strongholds of the upper Midwest and the Northeast are shuttering parishes and shuttering Catholic schools and combining and clustering parishes, so Boston and Philadelphia and Chicago and New York and many others, in the South, where I currently live, they can't build parishes fast enough. Right? The largest parish in the United States uh, is in Charlotte, North Carolina. Which I, Are you from St. Matthews? Uh, oh, really? It's a, I just gave a, a class there, actually. It's an amazing, it's like a city. <laughs> I mean, it's, and North Carolina, I think, is like the least Catholic state in the country. Um, in Atlanta, right, I think Atlanta is the fastest. Yeah. I mean, uh, when we moved to we moved in, uh, to to Charlotte, to North Carolina, just for a couple years, my husband taught at UNC Charlotte. He teaches social work. Um, and we sort of strategically planned where we were going to live around a parish, because there's like eight parishes in the whole city practically there's no, but but they're huge right i mean they just built a new a new cathedral in knoxville right in atlanta they cannot build parishes fast enough to contain the people that are there which is a reality that's so different uh, from those of us who live in sort of the northeast right it's also worth noting um and i and i note this just as a sort of uh, addendum to the discussion about parish shopping um, that we were having earlier uh, at the end of uh, Abbott Austin's talk. Um, that is certainly also a dynamic that's affecting sort of the present landscape of the Catholic Church. It's worth noting, however, um, and, and it's, it's important because about 30% of Catholics attend a parish that's not their geographical parish today, which is uh, much higher than in the past. It's worth noting, however, um, that the majority of that contingent um, are people of color. Are Catholics of color. So more than 50% of Latino, African American, um, and Asian American, maybe not Asian American Catholics, attend a parish that's not their territorial one. So the question is, and we like to sort of attribute this parish shopping thing to kind of like a creeping consumerism that's taking over our liturgical imagination, but it's, it's also the case that people are simply going where they're being served. Right? And so a question that we can ask ourselves is, well, how can, how can we serve people at this parish so they don't have to travel across the city? But I digress. Right? So overall, we can say Latino, African, African American, Asian, and Native American Catholics are responsible for the continued growth and vitality of Catholicism in the United States. Right? I'll say that again. <laughs> Latino, African, African American, Asian, and Native American Catholics are responsible for the continued growth and vitality of Catholicism in the United States today. 
Yet, of course, <laughs> look around this room, this demographic reality is not reflected in the faces of those who lead the church, right, both lay and ordained. It's also very much at odds with Catholic school enrollment and discourse on religious education. So while about 55% of Catholic school-aged children uh, in this country are Latino, so more than half, more than half of Catholic school-aged kids are Latino, only about 4% of them are enrolled in Catholic schools. Latino young people and other young people of color who are Catholic are also highly underrepresented in religious education programs, youth groups, retreats, and other faith formation and leadership-oriented activities at the parish level. Right? So this creates kind of a vicious cycle. Latinos aren't leading the church because they aren't welcomed necessarily into spaces where that leadership formation is happening, and then they don't participate in formation programs because they don't see themselves reflected in the faces of those who lead them, so it's like a vicious cycle. Additionally, right, conversations at parishes, dioceses, and especially colleges and universities often proceed without any attention to the fact that the majority of Catholic youth are Latino. Right? I can't tell you how many conversations on the future of religious education I've been part of where not a single Latino voice was represented in the room and where the conversation proceeds as if nothing has changed in the past 40 years. Right? This is ludicrous. We need to begin equipping leaders from within Latino and other new immigrant communities, not simply to join with us in this work, uh, but, but to lead the way in this work. So transformation two, new models of church life. Right? Models of parish life have changed. Right? While, like I said, the coexistence of multiple cultural communities in a single parish is not new, uh, this model of the shared parish as sort of a community of communities, some say, is becoming increasingly common. In the past, particularly in dioceses and regions of the country uh, where the establishment of national and ethnic parishes was most common, so like your classic Chicago, you know, your Polish parish, your Italian parish, your Slovak parish, Irish parish, all like in a one mile radius, right? The sharing of a single parish by multiple uh, sizable cultural groups was often understood kind of as an interim state, uh, a temporary arrangement until that group could petition the bishop successfully to establish a parish of their own. Uh, when national parishes were not an option, uh, efficient, we could say, Americanization of newcomers was the goal. Today, the culturally shared parish is not a temporary arrangement, but a unique and emerging model of parish life in its own right. Yet, the coexistence of multiple cultural communities in a single parish still feels, right, in many ways, kind of like an ad hoc arrangement, something that sort of works for the time being, but also has a sense of tentativeness about it. Whenever I speak with anyone who belongs to or ministers at a shared parish, typically an English-Spanish community, uh, most of the time they express kind of mild discomfort at the fact that they belong to the same parish as an entire group of people that they, they don't know and never interact with and don't know anything about based really on, on the fact of differences in language and ethnicity. I hear this especially from pastors, actually. Most acknowledge that they don't know what to do about it uh, or where to begin, but the discomfort is there. Transformation three. Uh, attitudinal and ideological shifts have occurred both within the church and within broader society. So generally speaking, painting in broad strokes, <laughs> strokes uh, public attitudes with respect to cultural diversity have shifted away from assimilationism, so this idea that newcomers should jump in the proverbial melting pot and come out a flag-wearing, apple pie-eating American, right, to sort of a, at least a more nominal appreciation uh, for cultural diversity. Uh, theologically, the notion of inculturation, uh, which entered the Catholic missiological lexicon after Vatican II, expressed the idea that the gospel can find a home in any culture, right? Just as uh, Christ became corporeal and particular in, in Galilee, uh, so too can the gospel take on flesh within the cultural particularity of any human community. Uh, in more recent years, the bishops have expressed the notion of unity and diversity through frameworks like interculturalism and integration and communion. These aren't, of course, just abstract trends, right? Many of you here this evening uh, are likely experiencing this reality firsthand in your own parishes and your own schools, right? An English-speaking community, in a Spanish community, or a Korean community, or a Vietnamese community, or whatever. In the Archdiocese of Boston, where I lived for several years, uh, parishes minister there to, to 27 different cultural communities every week. I think in, the, um, in LA, I think it's closer to 50. And if you're from a parish or school that isn't experiencing this transformation, talk to me again in five years, <laughs> and you, you will be. Our parishes and Catholic schools are, in a real sense, the borderlands in our midst. Perhaps more so than any other civic or social institutions we're part of, our parishes are places we're invited to the challenging task of joining with and loving people in their difference, right? 
this is not easy. This is a very different call than sort of the nice sounding suggestion that we should celebrate diversity, right? Which demands really nothing more of us than a general tolerance of the existence of people who are not ourselves. <laughs> Solidarity and difference requires, in the words of Gustavo Gutierrez, right, a true conversion to the other, right? A willingness to be challenged in our presumptions of normativity, a willingness to be the guest in the very place where we're used to being the host. So given the theme of this symposium, right, how can liturgical practice, uh, and perhaps more deeply, a sort of liturgical imagination, help to build bridges across borders in our parishes and schools? Social scientists have asked the question in a related way. Uh, how does ritual cultivate social solidarity? Often they say, how does ritual produce cultural or social solidarity, which sounds very not good. <laughs> so we're going to say cultivate. <laughs> uh, ritual on its own, of course, doesn't magically produce community, right? Like an equation or a, a magic trick or a commodity, right? Yet studies suggest that ritual does play a critical role in cultivating and strengthening social bonds. There's a great deal of research actually to support the idea that participating in commonly held pre-established rituals leads to intergroup cooperation. So what does that mean? For example, when a small faith sharing group recites the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of each meeting, or you begin each class with a prayer or something like that, the research uh, suggests that performing that ritual action together consistently helps you to strengthen your bond as a group. At the school where I taught, uh, every day at noon, the students and teachers would gather on the patio to pray the Angelus. Um, it was a pre-K through eight school. If you wanna see the most adorable thing you've ever seen in your entire life, watch a bunch of first graders pray the Angelus. It's, it's so <laughs> beautiful and just the cutest thing you've ever seen. Um, anyway, so, so sociologists would say that the daily practice of this commonly held ritual uh, contributed to the strengthening of community at my school, which I think in some way it did. Interestingly, however, a recent study also found that new rituals in newly formed groups, when repeated, can also promote intergroup bonding. In this study, researchers took people who didn't know one another at all, uh, who had never met before, who probably had not that much in common, and divided them into small groups. And half of the small groups were asked to begin their gatherings or meetings by performing some set of ritual actions, um, and the other half were not. And what the study found uh, was that those who began their groups with a ritual evinced higher levels of intergroup care and bonding than those who didn't. What that points to is the idea that shared communal participation helps to cement social bonds, even among people who are different, right? Who don't know much about each other, who perhaps have little in common beyond that shared ritual space. Scholars of diverse congregations, here I use the word congregations to mean predominantly Protestant congregations because that's where most of the studies are, are grounded, um, also have po uh, pointed us to the vital role of ritual practice in cultivating community in such contexts. Uh, sociologist of religion R. Stephen Warner, who's a sort of magisterial voice in the study of religious congregations, uh, summarizes decades of his ethno uh, ethnographic work in many, many different religious communities really throughout the world. Um, he emphasizes the, what he says, the, the crucial role of embodied ritual as a key to the capacity religion has to bridge boundaries both between communities and individuals. Chris Tires, a, a scholar of US Latino Catholicism, argues that uh, the spiritual and moral power of popular religious rituals, uh, devotional rituals, et cetera, is related to their capacity to become sites of integration and boundary transgression. Ritual practice, he argues, renders ambiguous boundaries between past and present, between you and me, between living and dead, public and private, sacred and ordinary, uh, personal story and communal narrative, participant and observer. When distinctions between us and them are ritually transgressed, we're moved at the moral level through feelings of empathy and solidarity. Practical wisdom also affirms this connection between ritual and community, right? In shared parishes, bilingual liturgies often represent best attempts to build bridges between members of distinct linguistic communities. Bilingual masses can be onerous <laughs> and imperfect, and a lot of times people don't like them, <laughs> um, especially when these practices aren't the norm. But the significance of such efforts should not be overlooked. Right? Indeed, such attempts at fostering community through shared, linguistically inclusive liturgical participation evince an instinct similar to those elaborated by the scholars I just mentioned. We sense that we become community by doing community. So, how does liturgical participation enable us to do community? 
uh, particularly in contexts characterized by significant cultural difference. To answer that question, uh, I turn to the work of religious studies scholar Adam Seligman and anthropologist Robert Weller, both of Boston University. Stay with me here. It's a little technical, but it's actually very, very, very fascinating. I promise you. So Seligman and Weller conceive of ritual as what they call subjunctive action. So for those of you who uh, are familiar with Spanish <laughs> or, or have studied Spanish or, or also are very, very good at English grammar because we also too have a subjunctive tense, a uh, little known fact. Um, this may mean more to you than others, but I will explain what this means, right? Uh, so um, when I speak in the present tense, uh, I name things as they are. So I am in a conference room. We speak in the subjunctive tense when we want to name things as, they wish, as we wish they would be right, uh, as, as we hope they would be, as we desire that they might become. So, I wish I were on a beach. Subjunctive tense. Just kidding, I'm glad I'm here. Or how about a more substantive example, right? Uh, I could say, in my parish, there is a separate English community, Spanish community, and Vietnamese community, and we really don't know what to do with each other. Present tense. I wish we were a more integrated community. Subjunctive tense. So when Seligman and Weller call ritual subjunctive action, what they mean is that ritual can be understood as the imaginative communal practice of a shared as if, right? It's the creation, they say, of an order as if it were truly the case. Ritual offers community of difference, communities of difference a shared embodied lexicon, a sort of common script, not only of words, but of movements and images, of sacramental food and drink, of story and art and song, for living into that which we hope to become, right? the body of Christ. Ritual, they say, is about doing something more than it's about saying something. It's the doing itself that lends ritual its power and meaning. Far from consolidating group identity in a sort of unified and singular way, ritual can instead be understood as disclosing a unique capacity to encompass and mediate difference and ambiguity without necessarily seeking to resolve it. Ritual is capacious, right? In contexts of profound diversity, which is to say in the absence of agreed upon language or meanings or identities in a shared parish, for example, ritual can be efficacious precisely because participants do not all need to hold an identical set of meanings or identities in order to participate. Now, of course, uh, Abbott Austin reminds us very helpfully, uh, you know, that we're called in a sense to a sort of unity of heart and mind. Of course we are. Uh, but a real sort of nuanced understanding of the profound and wonderful, but, but very profound diversity of the global church, uh, of which the U.S. church is sort of a microcosm, given our diversity, occasions the recognition that unity is very different from uniformity, right? We can be united in a, in a common purpose, united in heart and mind, united in a, in a common baptism, um, and yet our social and cultural and historical particularity uh, really conditions the way in which we understand the call of discipleship, understands our role in the church, understands, you know, our, our theological identities. Um, you know, so, so in some way, uh, when we are, are in a space with, with someone or communities that are very, very different from us, it can seem in a way that we're speaking in a different language, even if we're speaking the same language, right? Sometimes we feel like we're talking past each other, right? But Seligman and Weller argue that, that ritual somehow contains this, right? Ritual has the, the capacity to contain this profound diversity. They argue that the work of ritual teaches us how to live within and between different boundaries rather than seeking to absolutize them. Ritual forms communal imaginations by existing on the borderlines of reality in that liminal space between already and not yet. Ritual in the sense can be compared to play, right? A joyful, creative, communal imagining of a world that could be Right, that might be. We act like community, and when we do it over and over and over again, we become, in some way, a community. Interestingly, and this is a bit of an aside, but a critical one for those of us who puzzle often, for example, over the question of why young people aren't coming to mass, so I figured that this audience would find this just interesting, uh, the authors contrast ritual modes of behavior, this sort of as-if behavior, with what they term sincere modes of behavior, an as-is frame of reference. Uh, this is a line ar of argumentation similar to those that have been made about the, the supposed contrast between Catholic and Protestant worldviews, Catholics supposedly uh, espousing a, a worldview of, of presence, of enchantment, of sacramentality, and Protestants espousing one of rationality, divine absence, and sincerity. 
Sincerity, this notion of sincerity, Seligman and Weller argue, is sort of a modern trope evidenced in the present preoccupation with authenticity. The unspoken assumption about authenticity, they explain, seems to be that something is authentic only when it is personally and individually chosen. So if you don't choose it, the logic goes, it can't truly be meaningful to you. So Catholic college kids, for example, who don't go to mass, sometimes explain this decision in the well-meaning language of authenticity, right? They don't know what they believe anymore. They're questioning. They're not really sure. So they believe it would be insincere to participate in the ritual. So they explain. But Seligman and Weller argue, ritual does not require and is not necessarily concerned with sincerity in that way. It's important to approach this distinction with nuance. So stay with me here. People sometimes freak out at the suggestion that ritual practice is not sincere. That's not really what they're, uh, that's not really what they're getting at. Um, I'll explain where the authors are going. To illustrate the point, right, Seligman offers a, a helpful example drawn from everyday life. Right? Imagine a family of five, two parents, three kids. While their home is generally stable, loving, normal environment, uh, you know, it's also filled with the kind of daily quibbling and hair pulling and door slamming and whining and yelling of ordinary life, right? Uh, I have two kids who are very young, so I am already getting a taste of this, right? The parents decide that the family members need to start treating one another with a little more respect and love, right? More please and thank you, more sharing of toys, more helping with the dishes, et cetera, et cetera. What the parents are asking is not that family members love each other more, right? They already love each other. And even if they don't, right, even if there exists some deep and consequential rift between them, simply demanding that children feel more love for each other is not going to be effective, right? What the parents are asking is that the family members start acting as if they love each other, right? Which they do. They say, quote, what was missing was the behavior that would create a shared subjunctive, ritual. Eric Siegel was wrong. Love does not mean never having to say you're sorry. <laughs> that, that is precisely what love does mean, <laughs> at least if you want to share a life with the person you love. Love does not grow by telling other people that we love them. Love grows by acting as if we love them, right? Love, as the saying goes, is a verb, right? So is communion. So is community. As the authors state, getting it right isn't a matter of making outer acts conform to inner beliefs. Getting it right is doing it again and again and again. It's an act of world construction. It's very Aristotelian in a sense, right? We are what we do. We become what we do again and again and again. Community is not a feeling or an isolated action or a pronouncement, right? It's a habit, right? So the question becomes, how do we cultivate the habits of community in spaces of profound diversity? Right? So ritual becomes, in other words, the language of community. And it doesn't require that you give up your culture or I give up my culture, that we coexist in perfect harmony, right? It means that we practice doing life together. That's what ritual, including Eucharistic ritual, is. It's a practice of our faith. And it's that kind of practice that can be transformative, right? As the late Notre Dame professor Virgil Elizondo writes, through ritual participation and celebration, we begin to experience a new kind of we, a new kind of belonging. It's an experience of community that emerges in practice before it emerges in theory. It's lived before it's understood. And the best part is that it's not ultimately about us, right? The Eucharist is a ritual of thanksgiving to God. It draws us together beyond ourselves, right? Beyond our own particularity, united in the work of praise whose object is God, whose object is beyond our very selves. Theologically, Seligman and Weller's understanding of ritual as subjunctive action finds an analogy in Christian notions of eschatology, right? The subjunctive as if world created by ritual practice exists in the tension between the already of the incarnation and the often painful not yet of the kingdom of God, right? Between the body we are and receive and the even more perfect body we hope to seek and become. Is the work of the people, right? Liturgy is always work. Um, liturgy in context of diversity is hard work. Uh, indeed, as a, a, a lay leader working interculturally in my Boston parish put it, we have to work hard at figuring out how we hear one another's voices. So let's get very practical for a moment. In my pastoral experience and my research, intercultural liturgy works, so to speak, when five things are true. This is not a definitive list, um, but it's a start. Right. First, 
when it's highly embodied, right? Accenting highly embodied elements of the liturgy, Holy Week processions, for example, or the sign of peace, and developing new embodied rituals gives parishioners the opportunity for embodied participation, right? To touch, to embrace, to walk together in a literal way. The Eucharist, in the sense, is, is a ritual par excellence, right? Because it is an, it's an embodied ritual of a body that forms us into a body. Second, when it's highly participatory, right? The more lay people from all cultural communities that are involved uh, in liturgical planning and implementation and evaluation, the better, right? It's messier this way, right? Sometimes we feel like we have too many cooks in the kitchen, uh, but people have to feel like they have a stake. Uh, good leadership is key, uh, but beyond that, once you have good leadership in place, the more you can delegate small, minor tasks to a very, very broad swath of people, the more people feel like they have a stake. You bring the flowers. Can you bring the this? Can you do the that? Can you read the this part? Spreading out that, that sort of diff diffusing that responsibility, making a lot of different people stakeholders in the liturgy and the work of the people, um, often the more they feel united in this task. Uh, third, when people expect imperfection and discomfort. I think in the world of business, this is called managing expectations, right? Doing liturgy bilingually and interculturally can be disjointed, right? Even in parishes where that, that do this well all the time, there's still some kind of, it can be disjointed, it can be uncomfortable, it can be messy, right? But there's even sort of a, a beauty in this disjointedness. Um, number four, uh, of course, when it's done in conjunction with a larger vision or mission of intercultural collaboration at the parish. So as we said, of course, liturgy isn't a chemistry equation. It's not a magic trick, right? It has to be part of a broader structural effort to enact justice and intercultural collaboration at all levels of parish life, from you know, equity and compensation to empowered leadership, from representation and decision-making to culturally responsive ministry. Uh, and fifth, and perhaps most importantly, when it's supplemented by opportunities for celebration and social life, uh, for fun, uh, wherein people can come to, to be friends with one another, to really get to know each other, uh, to, to like each other, to care about each other. <laughs> and finally, uh, we're going to turn now to our, our final point. Uh, we've spoken this week um, in many different sort of ways and forms about the new evangelization, right? Part of what's new about the new evangelization is the call to recognize the many ways in which the church in the U.S. is in need of renewal, right? Adopting a posture of humility and openness, we recognize the ways that we ourselves, right, as pastoral ministers, as teachers, as, as people of faith, uh, yearn for an ongoing encounter with the gospel. When I said that Latino and African, African American, Asian American, and Native American Catholics are responsible for the continued growth and vitality of the church in the U.S., I wasn't just speaking numerically, right? Indeed, it would be a mistake to commit ourselves to the task of intercultural communion uh, for the sake of numbers, right? For the, the kind of the idea that given the frankly very alarming uh, rate of uh, white Catholic deconversion from the Catholic church, we need to embrace Latinos and other newcomers to kind of ensure butts in pews, so to speak, to ensure numbers. Um, while this is the case in some very, very basic way, right, we should really reject any urge to instrumentalize these newcomers, right? We're not doing this for numbers. We're doing this because these people are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Recognizing that the center of gravity in, the U in U.S. Catholicism is, is really shifting in a real way toward Latino communities, the question we should be asking is, what are some of the ways in which Latinos are evangelizing the U.S. church? Obviously, I'm painting in broad strokes here. There's no singular Latino experience any more than there's a singular you know, Euro-American experience. But that being said, broad strokes. I want to highlight three specific ways in which Latino Catholicism is evangelizing, teaching, challenging, stretching the US church. First, intergenerational approaches to ministry. This is an image from Jane the Virgin on the CW, the best television show currently on network TV. And frankly, it's a little wacky now, but the first, if you want to like a really, really good and very light <laughs> introduction to um, just sort of like a, a very real, very intergenerational kind of uh, Latina Catholic 
worldview. Watch the first two seasons of Jane the Virgin because it's, it's brilliant, actually. Um, and one of the areas of ministry in which I see parishes struggling most consistently, and this has certainly been the case in all of the parishes that I belong to or worked at, um, is, is sort of navigating the challenge of what we might call ministry over the life course. Uh, so getting youth to keep coming after confirmation, getting parents involved in the youth group stuff, offering adult education, et cetera, right? Ministry in Latino context is deeply, fundamentally intergenerational. And I think that we have much to learn. Um, we actually, interestingly on this point, we actually have a hard time translating Latino models of youth ministry to US context. Um, and it's hard to get Latino youth involved in traditional American youth groups. Why is this? It's because Pastoral Juvenil Hispana, what we would call youth group, is actually far more intergenerational in Latino context than US models of youth ministry are. Uh, the word youth in, in Latin America, Joven, encompasses everyone from like young teenagers all the way through people in their 30s. So for those of you who've been to World Youth Day, actually you probably noticed that all of the groups from like every other country seem a lot older than our groups are. Our, kids, our groups seem like little kids compared to some of the groups from, uh, from throughout Latin America and Europe. Uh, and this is correct. And it's because uh, the word youth in, in English connotes like high schoolers, sometimes middle schoolers. Um, but in Latin America and also in many places in Europe, youth calls to mind people anywhere from age like 15 to, to in their 30s. Um, so, uh, Latin American models of youth ministry are very, very, very intergenerational. Um, the, you know, and the, the bonds of mentorship and family that are created in spaces like that um, are really phenomenal. <coughs> it also means that, um, typically speaking in Latino parishes, there's not, what I've experienced is that there's not the same level of challenge that I feel that we experience in, in many Euro-American parishes of, of getting families involved as a family unit, right? Uh, it's, it's sort of the whole family present at everything, even often invoking the, the memories of, of, of dead relatives, you know, sort of the whole communion of saints present at everything. In the U.S., we kind of have a tendency to compartmentalize our ministry, right? We have like, uh, you know, like little kids, CCD and religious education, and middle school youth ministry, high school youth ministry, young adult ministry, adult education, ministry to the elderly, et cetera. Right? The example of Hispanic ministry invites us to think much more holistically and sort of organically about how we can foster intergenerational communion. This is one of the, the greatest challenges I feel that we face as a church right now. <clears throat> So the questions that we might ask then are in our parishes, how can we reimagine ministry as a family affair, right? Transcending these generational boundaries that we've in some sense kind of helped to create um, and not as an afterthought or an add on, you know, parent night or whatever, but as an integral dimension of the pastoral task and in our schools, right? Uh, we can ask the question how, perhaps through liturgy, uh, can we draw the entire family into the mission of our school? Second, the evangelizing capacity of beauty, right? Much of the vitality of Latino Catholicism comes from a fundamental recognition of the power of the aesthetic, right? Of truth revealed through beauty. Right? This is emblematized most vividly the, by the Guadalupin tradition. And actually this is um, in my parish in Brownsville, this is, it's, it's bigger on the screen than it is in real life. It's actually somewhat small. Um, this is sort of a, a little shrine right outside of the parish um, that I belong to in Brownsville. And people would lay flowers. The girls, after they would do their quinceañeras, would leave their bouquets there. Um, and it was always just this very, very beautiful, very organic, um, like lovely evolving space, right? That what was there changed daily, but it always seemed to be overflowing with beauty. Right. Uh, according to the sort of the, the, the tale uh, that's told about uh, Guadalupe's uh, initial apparition to Juan Diego, right, sort of a poor indigenous farmer, um, he's a, uh, he receives this incredible vision of this, of this radiant uh, woman, this, you know, who, who we, he later sort of recognizes as, as the virgin mother, as the, as the mother of God. And he's, uh, he's received by the bishop, right, the seat of power, <laughs> um, who, of course, doubts the veracity of this poor indigenous man's vision. Um, and uh, the woman, Guadalupe, makes roses grow out of season on Tepeyac Hill. 
And so he gathers the roses to show the bishop as a sign of the virgin's presence. And when he unfolds his cloak to lay the roses at the bishop's feet, uh, emblazoned on his Tilmer cloak um, is this iconic image of the Virgin Mary that's now um, hanging in, uh, in Mexico City in, in her shrine. Um, and each year there's a, a phenomenal pilgrimage participated in by millions and millions of people. Um, the story of Guadalupe, right, and Juan Diego is compelling on its own, right? It serves as often a, a sort of foundational narrative for the Latin American church's emphasis on a church of and for the poor. Um, but it's the beauty of her image, right? The aesthetic charge that her image carries that for hundreds of years has captured the hearts and imaginations of millions upon millions of people. It's Guadalupe's beauty that converts, uh, converts hearts, draws people to her, and thus to Jesus. There's a reason, right, that her image is everywhere in Latino and Latin American neighborhoods. Her beauty feels like a conduit of grace. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Right. There's a reason also uh, kind of historically for this emphasis um, on the aesthetic in Latino culture. Um, uh, sort of an interesting historical note, uh, the Latino devotional cosmology is rooted in Iberian pre-Tridentine Catholicism. So Spanish colonizers and missionaries uh, initially brought Catholicism to the New World, so-called, uh, before the Council of Trent had a chance to really make its effects known in rural Spain. Uh, Trent, broadly speaking, organized the church into the parish system and sort of smoothed out and streamlined, we could say, sacramental practice, kind of smoothing over the more magical, enchanted, sort of irrational, popular elements of devotional piety. Um, so Catholic lived practice in Latin America developed for centuries more or less independently of what was happening in Europe um, from whence those who introduced Catholicism to Eastern North America came. Um, and so that, that sort of aesthetic charge, um, the, the, the lack of a desire to be sort of shoehorned into rationalistic frameworks, um, this, this, this deep beauty and, and sort of uh, almost a, a graphic quality um, to Latin American devotional art is still very much present, right? So we see this emphasis on, on the aesthetic, on body, on bodiliness, on touch, on story, on song, on blood, right? Latin American sacred art and statues are, are often very graphic. Like I said, particularly the crucifixion, right? Blood and tears, torn flesh, faces bent in anguish. These images lay bare the, the sort of terrible beauty and profound mystery of self-giving love. Uh, in my parishes, both in Brownsville and Boston, both of which were predominantly Spanish-speaking parishioners, uh, would fashion elaborate manger scenes around the altar for Christmas, uh, and very, very elaborate empty tomb scenes for Triduum, using every sort of material imaginable. So for those of us raised in the sort of like cookie cutter <laughs> aesthetic milieu of like white suburban Catholicism, the decor can seem a little like a little much, kind of a little much, but <laughs> it reveals a fundamental truth, right? Beauty is a communal project, right? And it's the cultivation of beauty that we live, uh, it, and it's in the cultivation of beauty that we live our Eucharistic call, right? This emphasis on beauty, particularly the beauty of Mary and the saints, oh, there's more. <laughs> um, even the strange subversive beauty of the cross offers what I see as an alternative actually to the aesthetics of certain mass market youth ministry programs which often play on emotion, right, but offer little in the way of beauty, particularly beauty that's sort of robustly theological. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from the aesthetic tradition of Latino Catholicism. Third and finally, uh, foregoing P uh, polarizing binaries for Eucharistic loves. This is something that we've kind of, this has been a through line of this week, right? So much of the polarization that characterizes the church in the U.S. today is the result of our minds sort of having been formed to think in dualisms, right? The sort of binary categories, Republican or Democrat, right? Liberal or conservative, adoration or social justice, as those are like two different things, right? Legal or undocumented, us or them, da da da, et cetera, et cetera. This kind of dualistic thinking stifles and infects our theological imaginations and distorts our capacity to love each other, right? And it matters, as Tim showed us on Monday. My doctoral dissertation uh, was an ethnographic study of a, of a highly diverse Catholic parish with an emphasis on the community's intercultural uh, ritual and liturgical practice. 
in nearly all of my interviews with members of the English-speaking community, when asked about the challenges of ministry in a diverse setting like theirs, they spoke in these binaries. So this was true in my interviews with ordinary people. The parish's progressives versus the conservatives. They would talk about the Vatican II versus the traditionalists, more educated versus less educated, English community versus Spanish community, etc. Right? Even when noting legitimate divisions within the parish, it seemed that for my English speakers, there were only two sides to every issue, always in some way a variation on the classic liberal conservative binary, and everybody was either on one side or the other. My Spanish-speaking participants, however, were much more nuanced in their characterizations of community life at the parish. Right? Unlike the English community members, they didn't describe community dynamics in these sort of stark binary terms. Indeed, many actually cited the Eucharist as the source of unity among all, the posi uh, all of the parishioners. Um, one of the, the uh, lay leaders in the Spanish community, longtime lay leader, um, Ana Diaz, uh, you know, said to me, I said, well, kind of what keeps you coming back? What's, you know, what's, how do you work through these, these, uh, these divisions within the parish um, that you've dealt with for, you know, dozens of years now? And she just looks at me and says, for me, it's the Eucharist. You know, we're all here for the Eucharist. That's what joins us. That's what unites us. And I thought, yeah, you're, you're right. <laughs> um, it, was, it was actually, it was a lovely, it was a lovely moment, actually. So, Doing sociological work in parishes is actually a, can be a profoundly theological experience. So this afternoon, right, we've discussed transformations underway in the US Catholic Church. We've explored how ritual can become the foundation for building community across borders uh, in our parishes and schools. And we've examined three particular ways in which Latinos are evangelizing the US Church uh, with respect to ministry, beauty, and Eucharistic love. I want to conclude now by returning to Pope Francis. In his recently published apostolic exhortation, Gaudete et Exulte, uh, Francis writes, citing the Vatican II document, Lumen Gentium, the Holy Spirit bestows holiness in abundance among God's holy and faithful people. For, quote, it has pleased God to make men and women holy and to save them not as individuals without any bond between them, but rather as a people who might acknowledge him in truth and serve him in holiness. In salvation history, the Lord saved a people. We are never completely ourselves unless we belong to a people. That is why no one is saved alone as an isolated individual. Rather, God draws us to himself, taking into account the complex fabric of interpersonal relationships present in a human community. God wanted to enter into the life and history of a people. We don't practice solidarity to be politically correct or to celebrate diversity in some kind of superficial way, right? We do so because we believe that salvation is fundamentally communal, right? In the Catholic imagination, there's no such thing as a personal Lord and Savior. Solidarity is an expression of our peoplehood, the fullness of that communion, united across borders as the body of Christ. So now I want to invite you all uh, in the time that we have remaining, which is depending on how long Carolyn wants us to go. I know that I'm the only thing between us and dinner. Um, but for the next few minutes, perhaps, um, I would love, questions are fine, but also I would love you all to share your own experiences, um, challenges, wisdom, best practices that you have gained um, from working in your context. So we can all sort of uh, bring our own wisdom to the, to the table, so to speak. I just want to say, first, I grew up in Charlotte, but I'm out in Brevard right now. But one thing I found even out in our area, and this mm -hmm. is where the schools really do help, mm -hmm. is uh, we have one Catholic school in Asheville, we have one Catholic school in Hendersonville, and that's where the, the link has really been good in having much more community work together. Mm. So you don't have the us versus them. Uh, they, they've had really, there's been really good inter racial, intergenerational relationships with the Catholic school family. So I, ho I hope that that keeps on growing. That's I also great. have a prayer request for everybody. Now that the regional en encuentros are mm -hmm. ending and the national encuentro is gonna happen in the Dallas area in September, mm -hmm. I hope and pray that it's a great gathering for our Latino community here in the United States. And I also hope that we're able to really get some good, helpful service and, and unity uh, between all of our communities there. And I'm thankful for my parishioners who participated in Encuentro. 
That's great. And those regional gatherings have been extremely fruitful too. And it's been really heartening to see the work that's come out of there. And that's a, that's a great point that you make too, how uh, the fact that often our schools can be sort of the place in which uh, this sort of border crossing begins. I'm sure when you worked in Brownsville, you noticed the deep, deep faith that the Mexican people have, mm -hmm. especially in the Lady of Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I want to shock some people. Sometimes when I was over in Mexico and I took a taxi, it wasn't uncommon to see a very naked woman on the blazer with the Guadalupe next to it. Now, I would like to recommend a book. It's by Father Virgil Elizondo, The Galilean Journey. Yes. It will tell you the whole story of Guadalupe and what it means to the people. And that's a great recommendation. Galilean Journey. Um, the Mexican-American Promise, I believe, is the subtitle. He taught here for many, many years. Um, he was the pastor of um, uh, San Fernando in, in San Antonio um, and also was a, uh, on the theology faculty here of, of blessed memory. I'm not too sure if, if this is within the purview of our topic. That's okay. But it's my understanding, first of all, as a biased Anglo, I would think that people who are culturally Catholic, if they cross the border, they would gravitate toward a Catholic church. However, it's my understanding that a lot of folks uh, are evangelized by non-Catholics. And it's not a small number. It seems to be a large number. Mm -hmm. And what is it that is happening and, and their experience of receiving evangelization that we are not doing? That's a great question, um, and that's exactly right. So um, even though it, in some way the, the um, Latinos who are coming into this country are making up for, in a sense, the, the Euro-American Catholics who are leaving the church um, and occasioning a lot of growth in the church, um, there's also a very, very significant portion of, of Latinos who... Um, uh, come to the United States um, and uh, often uh, join uh, Pentecostal churches um, uh, and other Protestant, particularly evangelical denominations. And there's a number of reasons for that, both sort of sociological and liturgical. Um, one of the things that I hear a lot from Latino families is just the experience of liturgy in the United States is very different um, from that in Mexico. So it's not often this um, affective experience that's filled with floricanto, <laughs> um, as, as we say in Spanish, right? It's, 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 drier, um, and often that sort of aesthetic charge is present, they feel, in these communities, these Pentecostal communities, for example. Um, one space in which um, Latinos are, are really flourishing within Catholic uh, parishes is within Catholic charismatic renewal, um, because it sort of brings that spirit um, uh, of, of sort of what was so vital to their experience of worship uh, in Mexico and in Latin America um, and sort of uh, centers it within a parish context. And so uh, CCR, Catholic Charismatic Renewal, is one of the areas in which uh, Latinos seem to be really flourishing in this country. Um, other reasons that, that sort of researchers have cited have ranged in everything from um, this notion that sort of becoming Protestant is bound up in some way with American identity. So to become American, uh, we sort of become Protestant uh, and we start going to Protestant churches. Um, uh, of course, people talk about uh, various ways in which Latinos experience uh, discrimination, either overt or sort of um, uh, kind of tacit uh, in, in parishes to which they arrive, um, which of course turns them off to the idea of continuing to go to Catholic parishes in this country. Um, often the um, evangelical missionaries, Pentecostal missionaries, um, are much more present in neighborhoods, um, much more present um, in the spaces, kind of the civic institutions um, and the neighborhoods in which Latino families are, are are spending their days in, and so um, they sort of get 
uh, co-opted <laughs> uh, that way. Um, so there's a number of different reasons, but I think you're very, very wise to point us toward that dynamic because um, I think in some way the Latino presence right now is being kind of taken for granted. Um, we, we sort of assume <laughs> in some way that, that Latinos are going to save the church in the U.S., um, but we can't take that for granted. We have to, we have to work at this, um, and we need to figure out why so many of them are, are going to these evangelical churches. Um, I have a, um, an adopted daughter from Guatemala, and, um, uh, you know, she's 11 now, and a lot of uh, friends of mine also have adopted children from, you know, international, other, other countries, and, you know, it's growing in the U.S., um, and so what I have found um, at the church, we changed schools to um, the, the school and church we're at, not St. Peter's and Kirkwood in St. Louis, Missouri, and what the principal does there is a ritual, and I've never, I've never heard of this done, and it sure does unify the kids. So when you adopt a child um, before, you know, it's that, that final day when you go before and you are legally becoming their parents, um, that's, you know, that, that was the first day we could actually take my daughter anywhere outside of Guatemala because mm -hmm. we could go visit her, but we could never leave the hotel. So we became a family that day. <laughs> and that is called Gotcha Day. And many of you may have heard of this, but a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. So at St. Peter's in Kirkwood, when we, when we changed schools and we um, joined the school, one of the things that the principal shared with my daughter was, if you, sh if you celebrate Gotcha Day, we celebrate that here too. Mm. And so just like when birthdays are announced, every, you know, he always announces the birthdays over the speaker, and he also includes the Gotcha Day mm. for any adopted child in the school that chooses to celebrate that. So, you know, and he doesn't push it. It's sure. all a very, you know, children come to their own with it. And what a great way to not only recognize the child's special, but it, it unifies and it's not so, it, it can give the other children that are in the school, it, it doesn't look so odd or what's so mm -hmm. different or what, what is that? And it, it, there's a unity there and that is really special. And for the first time this year, my daughter really, she was excited to celebrate it, which is, is it hasn't been like that. So that was, I think, a ritual that yeah. they do, and it is very rare. So that is something that I am, I would just recommend because it's a great way to unify. That's really beautiful. And that wow. would be any, you know, it just it's something special. Yeah. So. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you for that example because I was going to ask um, our, at our school we're having more and more Hispanic children, mm -hmm. and they're all divided into faith families, so they're not divided by grade, but um, you have children, you know, K through eight mm -hmm. that are in a faith family. And I was just wondering if there were, if you had any examples of, of rituals, or do they just create them on their own, something that they could do that would be unifying. Yeah, that's, can you say more about the, the faith family idea? Because that's, I'm, this is interesting to me. Okay, uh, a lot of the schools in our area are doing, like, like the high school, they have, they have uh, faith families, and it's sort of like the Hogwarts thing, you know, where they're uh, united. Okay. Uh -huh. But so in the high schools, they have them, um, they're divided by, by saints or whatever, and they take on a, a particular charism or whatever. But the faith families at school, they, I believe that they meet once a week, and, and they, they do various things together. Mm -hmm. They pray together and, and that kind of stuff. So I, I just was thinking that that idea of, because we do have people who are leaving the school because of that, that the school is not, what it was hmm. and so um, I think in, if the the Anglo children um, could and everybody together mm -hmm. be united through um, a ritual that mm -hmm. that would uh, I mean I think it's a beautiful idea so. that's a that's so uh, that's really interesting now that you've explained it that I've seen that model replicated in a lot of places and I think thinking about that, particularly in the usefulness of a model like that, the sort of houses or faith families or, or whatever um, different schools choose to kind of call them as part of their school culture, um, utilizing that particularly in schools that are experiencing 
um, you know, rising levels of diversity as a way of sort of building group identity and unifying students, you know, it, among one another and sort of um, breaking them out perhaps of the of kind of the self-imposed segregation that we sometimes, you know, the lunch tables where, okay, all the Spanish-speaking kids sit over there and all of the Anglo kids sit over here. Um, in the school that I taught at in Brownsville, it was, a, it was actually a tricultural school. It was a, a Mexican-American, um, Euro-American, and Filipino school. It was actually about slightly more uh, Mexican-American students, but more like more or less a third, a third, a third. The Filipino community there was very, very large. For some reason in the Rio Grande Valley, there's, there's a huge Filipino community. Um, and one of the spaces in which um, students uh, sort of found it easiest to connect with one another were in um, sports, <laughs> um, in drama, and in music. So the school had actually an incredible um, it was a very, very small school with very few resources, but for some reason it had an unbelievable mass choir. Um, and so one music teacher there, and then I kind of helped out as well, but effectively one, one music teacher who knew what she was doing, um, taught instruments, she taught everything, the students sang in harmony, I mean she was incredible. Um, but uh, the students had the opportunity to sort of collaborate with each other within the context of mass, um, but in this very specific ministry. Um, and of course, music, you know, the, the act of creating harmony with one another is sort of symbolic in a way as well. Um, and so those kind of extracurriculars um, are often a good, a good space for that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I am a campus minister in a high school working with teens, which has its own opportunities. Um, <laughs> I've jotted down some great ideas. Uh, we, I work in a high school that has an ever-growing Hispanic population. Mm -hmm. And we've done many things to try to include. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge at mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. We've had bilingual masses. We have a Day of the Dead altar set up outside our chapel. Uh, but I'm wondering if you may have other suggestions mm -hmm. of things to include ritual and activities that would make that community feel more a part of the family of the high school in general. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great suggestion, or that's a great question, I should say. Um, and the and of course, and I and I know that you've kind of I'm sure thought about this too. And the in the question that I always had too, working um, both in the school and in the parish, was you always want to include people, but then you never want to feel like you're tokenizing people. Um, you know, so there's always a fear of well, I I know that this or, this or that kind of is a culturally responsive thing that I could do, but then also maybe that's not a part of your experience. So should I do that because maybe it would just feel like I'm sort of you know, tokenizing the Latino experience. I don't really know. You know, so all of these questions we analyze, and it's and it can be a risky process. And the 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 way that we move beyond that um, is by first and foremost, you know, bringing students in as leaders of those processes, um, which I'm sure is something that you do. Um, I hear people, you know, say a lot of time, like I I want to be more culturally inclusive in my school and my youth ministry, whatever. But I don't speak Spanish. I don't have you know I don't have any experience in Latino culture. Um, and I always say well, the good news is you don't have to, <laughs> um, because there's a bunch of kids who do. Um, so so seeing our work not so much as the ones who have to do everything, um, but rather as people who kind of bring in leaders, um, you know, the kind of the charismatic upperclassmen or two um, from the Latino community at your school um, who can form a little group and think really kind of creatively and, and in a way that's really relevant to their lives as teens um, about, you know, what are some things that we could do um, that... Uh, that you know would would make our cultural our, our, our cultural experience present here, um, and and also in a way that's really relevant to our lives as as often like you know third culture kids or bicultural kids. Um, one thing that I this is very very concrete, um, but one thing that has had a lot of success. Um, in Catholic campus ministry settings or sort of intercultural ministry settings um, is actually using the movie Coco, <laughs> um, which actually does a really beautiful job of portraying this sort of uh, Latino imagination of sort of this blurred boundary between living and dead, the ancestors, sort of a kind of a communion of saints, so to speak. Um, it's a really beautiful film. Um, and, and teenagers love Pixar movies, <laughs> um, like more than little kids do. Um, and so using kind of pop culture things like that to kind of, you know, create a conversation around, I think is one thing that, that off the top of my head could work. Well, as you will see by my accent, I'm Latino, from Mexico, Rosemary from Venezuela, and who else? You are from Colombia, Father. Yay! So, uh, first of all, I, I would like to recognize that the, 
the inheritance, the, the learning process is two-way highway. Mm -hmm. Because yes, uh, maybe the Latino faith is uh, full of color and passion, but we receive from you a lot. Mm -hmm. I think we learn to, to live with um, more civically, more orderly. You taught us to volunteer, and mostly the church in the United States gave us a family because we come here without a family and we find a family in the church. In Mexico, in many places, we have so many Catholic churches that we can go to mass every 30 minutes. <laughs> so uh, if I have something on Sunday, I can accommodate my mass to the leftover of my time. When I came here and I said, oops, Sunday, 7 p.m., I cannot go to Mass. How, how this happen? So my life starts changing hmm. around Mass. That is a huge thing that you are giving us. And not just me, families that, that will have to be more disciplined, hmm. not only with this passion, with, but with this more thinking why not just doing it. So we are also very blessed of uh, having the opportunity to live the best of your culture too. And I, I think it's not this miracle uh, dose that will start changing our communities as in our church, <coughs> Hispanics is a, a small community and Anglos is huge. We are now part of the staff because it happened. No, like that, so that, that is a, an important sign. Mm -hmm. But the change is also happening in our houses. I came here with five children, the youngest one, one year old. Uh, so now this feeling that we have that how to communicate, I have it as a mom. Because my son now, 17 years, he tells, Mama, we don't understand each other. I'm more American, and you are more Mexican. Mm -hmm. And I say, <laughs> So yeah, in everything, food, Santiago, try this. Ugh, no. <laughs> so uh, the way of communicating and talking and moving hands. So I have to learn to build bridges with mm. my own kids. Mm. Uh, and that is an everyday dying mm. of my a willingness or maybe my passion or my way of doing things to be able to reach somebody that I love deeply and I need to get in contact with. So if I can connect that image of me being a mom to a church being a mom where both communities would play at the same time the role of mom, mm -hmm. like dying to something. To be able to connect with the other, we will be finding good ways mm -hmm. of, of being together. Right? That's beautiful. Thank you. I love that you're, that reminds me too of a, one of the women that I, that I interviewed at my parish in Boston. Um, there's a very, very large Dominican and Puerto Rican community there. Um, and she had been going to her local parish after she, um, after she moved to the States like five or six years ago. Um, and eventually a friend brought her to this parish um, because of this thriving Dominican community. And she said almost the exact same thing, like this feels like home. You know, this feels, it feels like being home. Um, and she would take like three buses every Sunday across town, again, nuancing this idea of, of parish shopping, kind of thinking about the concrete reality of who's doing the parish shopping. She would take three buses across town um, to attend mass at, at this community that felt so much like home to her. Um, and then she finally bought a car, and then she said, okay, it's much easier after that. Um, and I, you're so wise, too, to, to point us toward the, the real challenge um, of that sort of intergenerational communion, particularly with um, kids who are, you know, either, you know, second generation or who came here as babies or, you know, for whatever reason, their cultural experience is very, very different than their parents and grandparents, um, because that causes, it can cause a lot of, Tension, and I think the way that you articulated that was so 
beautiful <laughs> um, and, and, and humble, um, and I think really serves as a model for for all of us uh, who have or or will eventually have teenage kids. <laughs> so thank you. So my name is Father Felipe, and I come from Florida, one uh, a Tampa, Florida, and I belong to a parish that is close to 7,000 families. Wow. Uh, out of the uh, 3,000, I would say, are Hispanic. And I would say that is a very, very diverse uh, Hispanic even uh, culture because we have people from Puerto Rico, from Colombia, from the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. from Cuba, from just a multiplicity of countries that even the way in which they celebrate the Eucharist the, their expression is very, very diverse. Mm -hmm. The people from the Caribbean are a little more uh, expressive in their music, whereas the people from South America perhaps are a little more like uh, a, a high mass, for example, the 1030 very um, solemn mass uh, in a regular church parish. Uh, so we have that diversity happening also within the, the Hispanic culture. And, uh, but in terms of building bridges, I think one of the things that helps a lot when it comes to hospitality, inviting them over, is also within the clergy. Um, one of the things that I always emphasize to the Hispanic community in my parish is the priests are born from the founded family, from the domestic church. And one of the things that builds bridges a lot right now is bilingual priests. Mm -hmm bilingual priests who can be that bridge, that voice to the pastor who is an American who is only English speaking, mm -hmm. and to the probably the other associate who only speaks Spanish. Mm -hmm. That's my case. I am a bilingual priest who has to be the intercession between the pastor and the other associate and be the face to the Hispanic community uh, on behalf of the pastor. So that in itself is, is, is a good thing that is happening, but I'm saying to the people, we need more priests yes. <laughs> because I can just count in my hand the number of priests, of bilingual priests or Hispanic priests that are in my diocese with the growing, rapidly growing Hispanic population. So it's, it's emphasizing vocations, not only with Hispanic, but with the other cultures as well, that it, they come from the, from the founded family because sometimes they say, oh, no, not my family. No, I want kids. I want grandkids. I want all these <laughs> things. And well, well, we need to also promote vocations and not be afraid to promote vocations so that we can have a better celebration and building bridges in our communities as well uh, in the parishes. So I just wanted to share that in, uh, as well. So. That's, thank you so much for, for raising that, too. And I know the, the diaconate in particular has been a space of, of a lot of vocations from Latino communities. Um, but the priesthood, for whatever reason, um, has not been as much. Um, and you're exactly right that more vocations are needed, both from Spanish speakers and from people who are bilingual in general. So that's, you're, you're very wise to raise that. The other thing I wanted to say, I thought of what I was going to say. Um, also to the, the, the previous commenter who, who gave us that beautiful reflection, um, I think what you're, um, you're talking about that sort of two-way street, that exchange that happens, this is the reason why um, sort of theologically and pastorally, you don't really hear much anymore about enculturation um, because uh, people started to realize that that seemed like a very one-way process. And so it's much more common uh, now in pastoral frameworks, for example, in the USCCB, um, Resources for Shared Parishes, um, to read about uh, interculturalism, this idea that we're always evangelizing one another, that this is always a two-way street. So thank you for raising that. Any other questions or comments? We're nearing the end of our time together. Okay, last one. <laughs> I think one of the big handicaps of serving Hispanics is that those of us whose ancestors were immigrants who came from different cultures have a very bad memory of coming from the outside. Mm. My family on one side, two generations came to the United States, not only spoke German but had their children educated in German. Mm -hmm. The church my grandmother was married in was burnt down by the Ku Klux Klan. Only with World War I and anti-German attitude mm -hmm. and a changing in the country 
to that change. I have cousins and relatives, anyone that speaks anything but English, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's a biopic narrowism within the church. Mm -hmm. I serve in two parishes where we have several strong ethnicities that within the town next to me had a history of hating each other and they spoke two different languages and they literally lived across the border from each mm -hmm. other. And yet when I talk about Spanish ministry, oh my gosh, they need to become American. As if the moment Hispanics step across the border, their skin needs to turn white, their clothes need to change, and they need to speak English immediately. Mm -hmm. And Americans say, why can't they learn English? I lived in California 20 years ago. They turned away 30-some thousand people for ESL classes because there were not enough teachers. But whether you learn English or not, our rights in the church are not by our color, our ethnicity, but by our baptism. Not even by the amount of years we spend in a parish. Mm -hmm. So my family's been in a parish 50 years. Tough toenails. Mm -hmm. the people that live in the neighborhood who are there are now citizens. They have an immediate right to equal respect. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, a lot of our clergy are the same narrow-minded and expect people to become American overnight. Mm -hmm. And that is a very painful situation. We want mm -hmm. to know, not merely because of what Protestants offer with a lot of exuberance, it's the narrow-mindedness of Catholics. And sometimes the Protestant churches are more welcoming than yeah. we are, and they are our people. Mm -hmm. They are our people. But it's, mm -hmm. I find it a very painful thing to watch. And I'm at the verge of trying to begin a Spanish Mass. And I, having done this before, go in with fear and trepidation of the mm -hmm. narrow-mindedness of my other parishioners who will leave the parish, who will stop giving money, and then will make verbal attacks mm -hmm. against the Hispanics. Because I have two churches. One church, I'm not even thinking of doing it because they're more narrow-minded. I would not want to inflict mm -hmm. them upon the good Hispanics in the area. And I serve those pe people. I love them. Mm -hmm. But they're nasty, and I don't want to punish good people with their narrowism. I hear you. The other parish, I'm not sure how it's going to go. And mm -hmm. I haven't announced it because I even have some narrow-minded people on staff mm -hmm. who, you know, are hard to do that. Anyways... Thank you for raising that. Thank you very much for raising that. And um, amen. <laughs> um, and I think w w the question that that raises, and maybe this is where we can leave it, is why does it seem so difficult for many Catholics who are ourselves, most of us, uh, the children of immigrants who were persecuted upon their arrival in this country, whether we were Irish or German, Germans especially, and what have you, Italians, um, why do we find it difficult to access those memories um, as points of solidarity and empathy and compassion? And how then, thinking about practice and ritual, how might we invite people to draw on those memories of their family as ways of accessing some sort of empathy or compassion for the new arrivals today? But thank you for raising all of that and yes. <laughs> Okay, well, let's thank Susan for being here and giving us such a thoughtful presentation. Thank you.